Uh, I'm Susan Bailey, Director of Education at the museum, and thank you all for getting out on a foggy, cool December evening. Um, and um, I'm sure you all are looking forward to tonight's lecture, which is uh, entitled Los Alamos in History, Memory, and Visual Culture. Uh, it's presented tonight in conjunction with the exhibition Macrocosm, Microcosm, Abstract Expressionism in the American Southwest. And that exhibition will be on view through January 4th. And I encourage you to add it uh, following tonight's lecture. Uh, it's the Records Gallery, which is in the lower level of the Stewart Wing. Our speaker tonight is Allison Fields, uh, who is currently the Mary Lou Milner Carver Professor of Art of the American West, Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Oklahoma. The BA in English and Native American Studies from Colgate University, and an MA in American Civilization from Brown University. In 2009, she received her PhD in American Studies from the University of New Mexico after completing her dissertation, False Closure, Narratives of Trauma, Healing, and American Nationhood. At OU, uh, Fields teaches courses in visual culture, Western cinema, public memory, museology, and cultural tourism. Dr. Fields is the managing editor of American Indian Quarterly. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Allison Field to the stage. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction. Are you all hearing me okay? Okay. Okay. So I wanted to just thank a couple of folks before I got started here. I wanted to thank Jessica Farling for doing everything to coordinate this lecture, and to Mark White for the fantastic exhibition, Microcosm, Macroco Mac Macrocosm, Microcosm, Abstract Expressionism in the American Southwest that this lecture is paired up with. And I am tonight sharing a smaller piece of a larger project that deals with cultural memory of the atomic bomb in both New Mexico and Japan. And while my title, talk is titled Los Alamos in History, Memory, and Visual Culture, I'm actually beginning with a discussion of something that has been excluded from public remembrance in Los Alamos. The first time the school children at Arroyo del Oso Elementary School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, heard the life story of Sadako Sasaki, they were encouraged to take action. Made famous by Eleanor Kaur's children book, children's book, Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes, Sadako is the most well-known child victim of radiation illness following the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. Though she was just two kilometers from the bomb's hypocenter, she appeared to survive the attack without injury. Ten years later, however, Sadako was diagnosed with leukemia, a disease directly linked to her radiation exposure. After being admitted to the Hiroshima Red Cross Hospital, Sadako was reminded of the Japanese legend of Senba Zuru, a sacred crane that was said to live for a thousand years. Following this legend, Sadako believed that if she folded a thousand paper cranes, she would become well again. Using any paper she could find, Sadako determinedly continued to fold cranes until her death at 12 years old. Wishing to honor her life, her former elementary school classmates garnered broad support for the 1958 construction of the Children's Peace Monument, more directly translated as the statue of a child victim of the atomic bombing. Located in the Hiroshima Peace Park, this monument features a bronze figure of a girl perched on a three-legged pedestal, lifted up, lifting up a gold-colored crane. The inscription on the monument reads, let no more children fall victim to an atomic bombing. This is our cry, this is our prayer, to create peace in the world. Today, children still send and bring folded cranes to this monument, and paper cranes serve as visual symbols of nuclear abolition and world peace. And you can see them in the display case at the base of the monument here. 
Moved by Sadako and her classmates, the third, fourth, and fifth graders in Albuquerque mobilized, with the help of their teachers, to create the Children's Peace statue in New Mexico, a sister statue to the monument in Hiroshima. Beginning in 1989, they raised funds through the Dollar a Name campaign, collecting 90,000 names from children from the U.S. and 63 other countries. The statue, a suspended gold globe featuring 3,000 beeswax molded miniature plants and animals cast in bronze, is the first U.S. Nas national monument funded and designed by children. The small sculptures link together the seven continents, symbolizing a singular global community. Dedicated in 1995, the statue was displayed in a number of locations in New Mexico, the Albuquerque Art Museum, the Ghost Ranch property in Santa Fe, the Santa Fe Children's Museum, and today at the Albuquerque International Balloon Museum. At each location, children decorated the statue with garlands of paper cranes, visibly linking the peace statue to an anti-nuclear symbol. While in Santa Fe, the statue served as a focal point of the city's annual Peace Day held on August 6 to coincide with the remembrance ceremonies in Hiroshima. During this event, the statue transformed from a bronze globe into a rainbow-colored umbrella of paper garlands, reflecting the some 37,000 cranes sent in from all over the world. And here's another close-up of the garlands of paper cranes. While the Children's Peace statue attempted to visibly link New Mexico and Japan in a plea for anti-nuclear world peace, the statue was never installed at its intended location. The statue was meant for a public park in Los Alamos, but when a proposal came to its city council in 1994, the city council refused to accept it. The refusal of the statue is significant and reflects Los Alamos's unique atomic history. The city is home to the Los Alamos National Laboratory, famously the site of the Manhattan Project, a secret effort to develop the atomic bomb during World War II. The laboratory continues to serve as a major research and development site for nuclear weapons. When declining the statue, city officials expressed their fear that the park would become a rallying point for peace activists and be seen as an indictment in Los Alamos' role in creating nuclear weapons. Further, the paper cranes that adorn the children's statues visually recall the bodily trauma experienced by Sadako after the bombing and her unfulfilled wish to become well again. This decision to reject the peace statue shows the ways that officials manage and contain public memories of the atomic history in Los Alamos in strategic ways. Cultural memory, which involves the selecting of past events to be linked together in the expression of identity, requires that certain memories are left out or forgotten. Because the message of nuclear abolition stands in contrast to LANL, that's the acronym for the Los Alamos National Lab, to LANL's past and present agenda, the visual symbols that flourished in Hiroshima were intentionally excluded from public remembrance in Los Alamos. Instead, the visual discourse surrounding the nuclear history of Los Alamos, given form in historic markers, museum exhibits, art, photography, and film, among others, emphasize scientific ingenuity, national security, and victory in war. I argue that the history of the the deployment of the atomic bomb is marked by efforts to visually contain the trauma caused by the bombings, omitting alternative voices and histories. However, this containment is never complete and is prone to leakages. In this talk, I will consider how the atomic legacy of Los Alamos has been selectively made both visible and invisible in public view. Los Alamos National Laboratory, which was first known as just Los Alamos Laboratory, began with intense efforts to veil visibility, the research that was conducted, its location, and the people that lived there. In 1943, the United States was at war with Japan, Germany, and Italy, and was still reeling for the, from the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Scientific advances occurred on a microscopic level, 
specifically the observation of uranium fission had raised the possibility of creating a new kind of weapon. In 1942, a group of scientists in Chicago, under the direction of Enrico Fermi, had brought about the first man-made nuclear chain reaction. However, in order to produce a fissionable center for an atomic bomb, scienti scientists needed a strategy, strategy to isolate uranium-235, a lightweight isotope that occurs in only seven-tenths of one percent of naturally occurring uranium. Plutonium, which could be man-made in an elaborate process from natural uranium, provided a second possible fissionable material. However, in 1943, all of the plutonium in the world could fit on the head of a pin. The creation of Los Alamos Laboratory, also known as Project Y, became a central part of the secretive nationwide research and development program, the Manhattan Engineer District of the War Department. The mission of the Manhattan Project under the direction of General Leslie Groves and the civilian leader J. Robert Oppenheimer was to perform the necessary research, develop the technology, and then to produce the actual bombs in time to affect the outcome of the war and to serve as the first line of defense in the United States. As Mark White writes in his exhibit catalog to Macrocosm Microcosm, quote, the establishment of Los Alamos National Laboratory in 1943 linked the Southwest to the expansion of human knowledge into the microcosmic spaces of the atom. The scale of atomic research contrasted with the open spaces of the New Mexico landscape. The location of the laboratory on the remote Parajito Plateau in New Mexico's Jemez Mountains was strategically selected for its isolation. Here is a slide from nearby Bandelier National Monument that is now at the Historical Museum in downtown Los Alamos. Early map makers had noted that a series of mountain peaks in the area had formed a circular shape of connected valleys. Through relief maps, this geographic feature was recognized in the 1920s as the rim of an extinct volcano. And evidence of ancient volcanic activity, volcanic ash, cone-shaped hills, and boiling springs further marked the area. The circular area was identified as a caldera, a huge soft saucer left when a volcano collapses upon itself after spewing all of its insides out. Next to the caldera, the Valle Grande and its surrounding peaks, the long, narrow Parajita Plateau extends across the eastern slope of the Jemez Range overlooking the Rio Grande. When scouting locations, the plateau was found suitable because it was far from either coast, it was sparsely populated, it had some existed, existing roadways, housing, and utilities, and was picturesque enough to be a desirable place to live for so-called high-maintenance scientists. And it was, at the time, home to a, a small number of farmers and a ranch school for sickly boys from wealthy homes who the boys would wear shorts year-round and sleep on screen porches. And this housing from the boys' school ultimately became known as bathtub row to the scientists that lived there. That was because this was the only housing on the plateau that actually had bathtubs. Um, so in 1942, the U.S. Secretary of War notified the headmaster of the school that the plateau would be appropriated for the war effort, and the school hurriedly closed. Native Spanish homesteaders had farmed the land and raised livestock there for 300 years, and Pueblo people had also used this land for hunting and ceremonial purposes for many years before that. According to a short film, produced by the Bradbury Science Museum in Los Alamos. These residents all, quote, proudly and willingly relinquished, unquote, their access to the land for their war effort. The Los Alamos Historical Society, which is right in the center of Los Alamos, places structures from bathtub row, uh, gives an example of a Spanish homestead, and then a 
Pueblo village site all side by side right next to uh, basically a just big parking lot um, with a paper store. So there's kind of this overlap of, of history that's happening right in the center of town. So construction soon began at, on the plateau and workers carved into the volcanic rock. Constructed roads, homes, and laboratory spaces for scientists and their families from across the country. And when they arrived, they promptly disappeared. All mail came to P.O. Box 1663 Santa Fe, and birth certificates also listed this P.O. Box along with Sandoval County, rural. No, no names were listed on driver's license, only numbers and scientists took on false names and were forbidden to mention Los Alamos when they traveled. And all of the people that entered and left the plateau had to show a pass to get through a heavily guarded security gate. It was a town with, quote, no unemployed people, no in-laws, no invalids, no idle rich, no poor, no jails, no sidewalks, no garages, and no paved roads. The average age of residents was 25, and recently the unique nature of this town was the inspiration for the 2014 WGN television series, Manhattan. This series just completed its first season, which the Los Alamos Historical Society marked with viewing parties and a discussion board to debate the show's historical accuracy. And one promotional poster that we see here stressed the rather ominous need for secrecy and the denial of vision. If you see something, don't say something. After the atomic bomb was developed in Los Alamos, efforts to suppress visibility continued. The world's first nuclear test was held on July 16, 1945, at the Trinity site on White Sands mi Missile Range, the location of which, at which scientists and military officers gathered in bunkers in the Jornada del Muerto desert early that morning to witness the detonation of the gadget. And that's what we see here with Oppenheimer's successor, Norris Bradbury. And the, the gadget was a plutonium bomb with the code name Trinity and it was deployed from the top of a 100-foot steel tower. The Photographic and Optics Division at Los Alamos developed specialized camera equipment to capture the test blast. The explosion at 5.29 a.m. marked the culmination of the six-year Manhattan Project and created a never-before-seen visual spectacle. A mushroom cloud pl plumed over seven miles high flashing purple, white, and green. While intentionally deployed in a low residency area, people could feel the shock waves for up to 100 miles, and the explosive flash was visible in areas extending to Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and El Paso. The Alamogordo Air Base attempted to contain speculation by publicly claiming that an ammunition explosion had occurred in a remote area, causing no injuries. The wartime Office of Censorship assisted, limiting news reports to the approved press release and selected eyewitness accounts. The test in the New Mexico desert made way for the creation of Fat Man and Little Boy, bombs that would be used imminently in the war effort. The United States entered World War II in 1941 after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. At the same time that the bomb was being developed in New Mexico, the U.S. was also embroiled in war in the Pacific, and on August 6, 1945, American forces dropped the first atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, and three days later dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. The high pressure at the epicenter of the explosions and the blast wind that followed crushed buildings and leveled built environments. The bombs killed over 100 thousand civilians in Hiroshima and 70,000 in Nagasaki, many almost instantaneously. Radiation poisoning added to these death tolls and many survivors or Hibakusha 
were left with chronic illnesses and disfiguring keloid scars. Shortly after the bombings, on August 15th, Japan surrendered. From, 14, from 1945 to 1952, Japan was ruled by allied powers and made the transition from an empire to a democratic state. During this time, public remembrance efforts began in Japan. Beginning in 1950, work began to create the Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima, and in 1952, the park hosted its first annual peace memory ceremony. During the Allied occupation, the US government banned all photographs of killed or injured Japanese citizens in American media and only selected images of destroyed or damaged landscapes were made public. Instead, officials touted the success of the secret military operation, the ingenuity of nuclear science, and most significantly the, to the American public, the victorious end of World War II in the Pacific. While the bombings thrust the world into the atomic age, immediate post-war censorship policies actively diminished the visibility of nuclear trauma both in the United States and Japan. In the years that followed the conclusion of World War II, the possibilities of atomic power took on new forms in both the United States and Japan. In President Harry Truman's farewell speech given on January 15, 1953, he reflected that the atomic bomb quote, had to be used to save hundreds of thousands of American and Japanese lives. Later that year, new president Dwight D. Eisenhower delivered an address titled Atoms for Peace to the United Nations General Assembly, remarking, so my country's purpose is to help us to move out of the dark chambers of horror into the light. Eisenhower declared to find a way by which the minds of men, the hopes of men, and the souls of men everywhere can move forward towards peace and happiness and well-being. In the 1950s, radioactive isotopes were being used in medical diagnostics and research, and the first full-scale nuclear power plant opened in the United States. These scientific achievements, however, were clouded by the fear over the already proven, proven destructive nature of atomic power. In the exhibition catalog, Vital Forms, American Art and Design in the Atomic Age, Paul Boyer writes that, quote, the logo of the peaceful atom, the proton nucleus with its orbiting electrons that we see here, did battle with the iconographic, in the iconographic arena with the logo of the destroying atom, the mushroom cloud and the mushroom cloud proved to be the most potent. These anxieties, heightened by the Cold War, were funneled into nervous jokes, nuclear kitsch, monster movies such as Godzilla, which we'll come back to. In 1950s and 19, the 1960s in Los Alamos, research at the laboratory was continuing on efforts such as Project Rover, which explored the possibilities of fission to achieve nuclear rocket propulsion, and Project Sherwood, a project by the Atomic Energy Commission to control thermonuclear reactors. And these endeavors demanded world-class scientists, and laboratory workers turned to the art world to boost recruitment efforts. Robert Meyer, who was the assistant personnel director in charge of recruitment, worked with the Stables Art Gallery of Taos to create Art in the Atom, an exhibition of contemporary art used in scientific advertisements. According to the gallery director, Meyer selected already completed works from eight Taos artists whose work was, quote, sufficiently avant-garde, provocative, and eye-catching to arouse curiosity, end quote. All of the works address the environment and fit themes of space, energy, motion, dynamics, thrust, propulsion, technology, mystery, and experience. The exhibition catalog drew parallels between the innovations of the work done by both the laboratory and this group of artists. And I spend some time here because one of the paintings selected for this exhibition, Louis Rybeck's Suspension, is part of the Macrocosm-Microcosm exhibition. 
Ryback was a Russian artist born, a Russian born artist who moved to Taos in 1943 and founded the Taos Valley Art School in 1947. And he reflected on In Flight, which was another painting that was in the exhibition, and on Suspension, which we see here. I found myself forming objects and shapes to give the illusion of moving above the earth, away or suspended in space, with a life of its own, to come and go, stay or not. At first glance, the painting selected for this laboratory sponsored exhibition did not disrupt the laboratory's focus on scientific ingenuity and national security. Interestingly, though, Ryback and his wife, the artist Beatrice Mandelman, were reportedly kept under FBI surveillance for decades after two Taos residents accused them of being subversives, showing, again, alternate narratives find their way into the peripheries of official histories. A photographic collage by Japanese arti American artist Patrick Nagatani fully further illustrates this point in a more contemporary setting. Part of his 1990 series, New Mexico's Nuclear Enchantment, Nagatani's collage titled The Effects of Nuclear Weapons, Bradbury Science Museum, Los, Al Los Alamos National Laboratory, New Mexico, highlights the complexities of cultural memory. The collage's dominant image is a photograph of the museum exhibit that emphasizes the principles of fission, fusion, and radiation. The photograph of the Science Museum, taken before it moved to its current location in 1993, depicts a lofty industrial feeling interior reminiscent of a warehouse or a factory. Natural light filters in, revealing a sterile gray floor and oversized navy orange and black panels. No, no visitors populate the space, and the text labels are placed curiously above eye level. The exhibit's central panel is labeled weapons concepts, and the text reads, a nuclear weapon explosion causes damage through nuclear radiation, intense heat energy, and a powerful blast wave. The specific effects will depend upon the weapon design, explosive yield, location of the burst, air surface or subsurface, and the prevailing weather conditions. While well, the museum text describes how nuclear weapons inflict damage, it is notably silent on listing effects on human bodies. When Nagatani visited the museum, he was taken aback by the lack of humanity in depicting the toll on nuclear, of nuclear weapons. He was further influenced by reading Peter N. Kirstein's pointed critique of the museum offered in his article, The Atomic Museum, where Kirstein discusses the Bradbury in terms of psychic denial that stresses the friendly, fun, and useful aspects of atomic arsenals. Nagatani noted the lack of danger and dread apparent at the Bradbury and felt that the military rhetoric evident in the museum creates a psychic numbing to the maths mass deaths caused by the bombing. In this collage, he corrects this absence of human trauma by superimposing in the foreground the images of several pale, ghost-like Japanese children and a series of glass beakers marked with Japanese names in letters and characters. Nagatani's own nieces and nephews, faces made deathly with gray paint, stand in for the victims of the bombing. While their young age implies a sense of innocence, these ghostly children also serve as first-hand witnesses to the trauma of the bombing. The children share their experience through their presence and their di direct gaze at the viewer. Nagatani positions the children in the left corner of the collage, their bodies cropped from view, and their faces fading into a set of beakers. The beakers obtained from the University of New Mexico Chemistry Department and filled with wood ash, reference the bodily remains on display at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. While both the children and the ashes invoke subjective human experience, they blend with the beakers instruments of quantifiable scientific measurement. The beakers form a triangle at the bottom of the collage with the tip pointing back into the exhibit space. Nagatani's collage juxtaposed two very different forms of cultural remembering. 
by overlaying the image of the ghostly children and glass beakers onto exhibit panels charting scientific data, the narrative of human loss is placed in contrast to that of technolo technological achievement. Nagatani's placement of the children is significant. Effects of nuclear weapons suggest that such efforts to contain human trauma always ultimately fail, and that competing memories will continue to haunt the peripheries. Through Nagatani's intervention, a bodily presence is inserted into the aseptic environment of the Science Museum. In a short film about his series, Nagatani describes his vision to place ghost children and the beakers in the frame of the Science Museum to, quote, present another display in the museum that they should have. This insistence that an alternate display should be part of the Science Museum raises questions about museum representations of nuclear history. How do the narratives put forth by the museums manage experiences of trauma? And with what awareness of cultural memory? Finally, what alternate memories haunt these exhibition spaces? Nagatani's collage selects that, suggests that even when left out of public remembrance, the presence of atomic victims cannot be fully erased and continue to haunt narratives of scientific progress. However, at the Bradbury Museum in Los Alamos, there is little to suggest the human toll caused by the bombs. Rather, the museum focuses, again, on the scientific ingenuity of creating the first atomic bomb, the progress made in nuclear research, and the importance of securing and defending the nation. The museum's stated mission is to interpret laboratory research activities and history to official visitors, the general pub public, and laboratory employees to promote greater understanding of the laboratory's role in national security programs, to assist the taxpaying public in making informed judgments in these matters, and to continue visitors' knowledge to science and technology, and to improve the quality of math and science education in northern New Mexico. The Bradbury Science Museum, founded in 1962 and again moved to its current location in 1993, is located in the, in the center of Los Alamos and bills itself as a bridge between Los Alamos National Laboratory and the community. Atomic museums in the United States are placed near sites of nuclear weapons production, spaces that are, quote, alternately secured, monitored, contaminated, and forbidding. Brian C. Taylor suggests that museums situated near such production facilities boast an authenticity of place, but also invite visitor unease about uncontrolled contact with both the ominous symbolism and residual radiations from weapons production programs. Unstable boundaries between nuclear objects in display on museum display, presumed to be at safe remove, and those at use in nearby facilities heighten this feeling of unease. While a formal extension of Los Alamos National Laboratory, the low gray orange and orange stucco building of the Bradbury Museum blends in with its unremarkable commercial surroundings. Unlike many of Lanel's buildings, the Science Museum requires no special clearances and is free and easily accessible to the public. The museum draws about 100,000 visitors each year, reaching a far smaller audience than the, museum, uh, than the Peace Museum in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, upon entering the main lobby, the museum's exhibit space is clearly divided into three galleries, the history gallery, the research gallery, and the defense gallery, each with a separate entrance. Vid visitors typically start in the history gallery, where the background of the laboratory is depicted in linear fashion. The gallery provides illustrated timelines, newspaper clippings announcing major world events, documentation, and video of life in Los Alamos as the site of the Boys Ranch School transformed into a laboratory for harnessing nuclear power. Entering the gallery and moving from left to right, the exhibit begins with a text panel addressing the beginning of the atomic age, noting the research developments in understanding atomic fission and the start of World War II. Scientific curiosity, it says, turned into the realization that a weapon of incredible power was possible. 
According to a quote by French scientist Bertrand Goldsmith, this power quickly became the domain of a new elite, nuclear scientists aware of their moral and political responsibilities in shaping history. A curving timeline covering scientific development in atomic physics from 1895 to 1945 illustrates this trajectory. Two other timelines are prominent in this exhibit space. The first depicts major world events, runs on the top of the wall, ticking off the years between 1932, the prelude to war, and 1945, the war in the Pacific. And a second, smaller timeline, positioned lower in the exhibit, demarcates key events in the laboratory's history. The area between the timelines is covered in collage-like fashion with text, historic photographs of Los Alamos, American newspapers from the beginning of World War II, and the telev television screens looping a short video about the Manhattan Project. Small tables and stools against an exhibit wall allow visitors to view the videos and push the large red buttons to hear further narratives of, from the scientists involved. Detailed white statues of Robert Oppenheimer and Lieutenant Leslie, General Leslie Groves, key players in the Manhattan Project, stand prominently on either side of, of the stools. Groves is adorned in military dress and glares in the distance, while Oppenheimer is dressed in a suit, tie, and top hat and seems to be engaging him in conversation. Sitting in the midst of this overflow of visual, textual, and oral information immerses viewers and places them squarely inside the historical narrative presented in the exhibit. And I was just at this museum last Friday, and the museum had placed a selfie station next to Oppenheimer, um, encouraging visitors to take selfies and label them with the hashtag science selfie, selfie Lanel, and I suppose further allowing visitors to place themselves in, in history. So moving around the room, the far wall of this exhibit focuses on the early 1960s, again, including a timeline and news clippings pertaining to the Cold War. And the last wall is dedicated to a framed black and white photograph of the people of Project Y at Los Alamos under the heading, They Changed the World. A short film titled The Town That Never Was plays on loop in an adjacent auditorium recounting the early history of Los Alamos and its transformation during the war. Visitors would likely move next to the research gallery where the range of research conducted at the lab is highlighted, including projects in computing, radiation, lasers, accelerators, and space science. This gallery is most predominantly an informational space. Brain mapping, understanding the human genome, global climate research, and scientific com computing are among the key points. Recent renovations to this gallery highlight the importance of nanotechnology, which you see here. An instructional room called the Tech Lab is accessible through this gallery, as is the museum's short film, second short film, Mission Stockpile Stewardship. And this film stresses the importance of maintaining reliable nuclear weapons that could serve as a deterrent from attack. This message segues directly into the defense gallery, the exhibit space reflecting the main mission of the laboratory, that of national security. The exhibit includes reproductions of a W-80 warhead, air-launched cruise missile, Mark 12A, B-61, and B-83 bombs, and a Fat Man, a bomb identical to the one dropped on Nagasaki and similar to the device tested at Trinity. The gallery also includes information about the Nevada test site and underground testing. Well, again, the stated purpose of the museum is to represent the research activities and history of the laboratory. There's one space available for competing narratives. A small alcove, oops, more of the defense gallery. A small alcove between the research and defense galleries is used to acknowledge the debate over using the bomb. A public comment book is available, as well as a space for non-laboratory related groups to post their positions. And recently, 
the comments tend to slant to the anti-war side with the most recent just being war sucks. Um, so this tucked away corner shows how competing narratives have been pushed to the edge of the museum but are necessarily present. The three tiers reflects the way Lanel envisions itself, suggesting scientific progress made over the decades and the need for nuclear defense. This narrative is also employed by other atomic museums in the United States. In a review of the Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada, Matt Ray notes that in this museum there was, to my eye, this is Ray speaking, no visible critique of the foundational tenets of scientism that ideological belief that superior technology liberates us and serves as the guarantor of freedom and democracy. Alternative narratives appear as only, quote, blips on a lengthy timeline that snakes across the walls, brief snippets in a video in multimedia presentations. Like at the Bradbury Museum, conflicting narratives are marginalized or left out entirely. And these are some small exhibits, um, panels created by community members. Until recently, a gift shop at Bradbury Museum, at the Bradbury Museum, was located in the neighboring building and sold a wide range of toys, books, and souvenirs. The gift shop created an endpoint for the museum self-tour and provided the opportunity to take home a visual reminder. The gift shop completed the museum's narrative and offered a way to neatly contain the visitor's experience. By pur purchasing a souvenir such as a shot glass decorated with a metal replica of Fat Man and Little Boy or a faux road sign reading Atomic Avenue, attention is shifted away from any troubling thoughts of American aggression. In Marita Sturkin's examination of tourist practices after the Oklahoma City bombing and 9-11, she discusses the complex relationship between traumatic memory, consumerism, security, and kitsch. Kitsch objects signified, quote, the complex relationship of mourning and consumerism and the economic networks that emerge around historical events. Such practices of consumerism reflect a deep investment in notions of American innocence. The atomic bombing influenced some of the most broadly recognizable kitsch objects in America. In particular, Constantina Titus writes, the mushroom cloud itself has become an excellent example of American kitsch that is ironically viewed somewhat wistfully as a nostalgic icon reminiscent of simpler, safer times. As a symbol of American power and military achievement, the circulation of the mushroom cloud imagery reinforces national narratives of progress and defense. Through kitsch objects available for sale at the bookstore, the human trauma caused by the bombing is evaded and the friendly and fun aspects of nuclear power noted by Kirstein are emphasized. And this bookstore did close, but there's a gift shop now at the Los Alamos Historical Society that still provides the opportunity for visitors to purchase toxic candy, fluorescent nail polish, and atomic postcards like, like these. So, In addition to juxtaposing differing narratives of nuclear history, just to return to Nagatani's nuclear enchantment series, poses the museum as a site for learning and conveying cultural memory. As Sally Price notes, while well, every telling of a tale is an act of construction and some details are put in and others are left out, museums demand a particularly merciless level of selectivity and that gives them special power to slant stories in one direction or another. These Choices have lasting implications on how trauma is represented and remembered over time. Much has been written about the controversies inherent in representing atomic, the atomic bomb to a broad audience, particularly after the Enola Gay exhibition at the National Air and Space Museum faced numerous revisions in the 1990s. Museum spaces, with their combination of narrative discourse and visual representation, are crucial to developing memory narratives that make trauma knowable. However, in ex 
framing experiences of trauma, museums necessarily privilege certain memories and push others to the periphery. The Bradbury Science Museum is not tethered to the event of the bombing, but rather seeks to paint a broader picture of the long-term development and possibilities of nuclear power. Los Alamos seeks to maintain a program of nuclear re research in line with American notions of technological ingenuity, homeland security, and scientific progress. However, narratives that seek to contain atomic trauma are always precarious. Long established cultural memories presented in the museum as settled may be quickly overturned. As we have seen, Nagatani's effects of nuclear weapons provides a visual representation of the lack of easy resolution to atomic trauma. In the specter of the ghostly children, the promise of trauma, the total disruption of safety that would take young lives haunts the exhibit space of the science museum. This ghostly haunting forces viewers to consider how personal remains of the bombing victims, such as those on display at, in Hiroshima, might complicate existing atomic science museum narratives. Finally, by looking closely at exhibit spaces themselves, spaces for alternative memories can be located. The Bradbury Science Museum, along with other visual forms of public remembrance in Los Alamos, offer effort, evidence that experiences of atomic trauma cannot be fully contained. To return to the New Mexico Children's Peace statue, the children who initiated the statue are now grown and plan to represent it to the Los Alamos City Council suggesting that efforts to strategically manage public remembrance are always incomplete and insufficient. Thank you.